back in 1983 when the premier padmini and hindustan motors ambassador were the only cars that you could really see on the roads maruti suzuki brought in the maruti 800 a car aimed for the indian middle class in a very socialist india a car that was ideally aimed to be bought by families who were not earning perhaps as much to buy a really aspirational car but a car nonetheless for a family who also wanted to graduate let's say from a two wheeler which primarily was the mode of transportation for indians back at that time the company of course that made it all possible and really fought a lot of skepticism to make it possible was of course maruti suzuki and i'm privileged to be in conversation with mr rc bhargava chairman of maruti suzuki sir thanks so much for speaking to us Thank and you. really what a 40 years it has been for you right uh, we were just discussing how this was a company uh, nobody really expected to thrive as it did right i mean let alone thrive uh, perhaps to even exist beyond a few years it was a public sector enterprise a government car company things unheard of uh, almost set up in a sense to fail uh but here we are uh the brand has this ubiquitous presence on indian roads uh you are one out of every second car almost that sold in the country at this point in time and of course looking at 40 years this is when a lot of competition came in wound up came back in wound up again right but you've been here so how does it feel looking back at those 40 years from this milestone um you know it's uh almost unbelievable what has happened when we started as you said people gave us a very short life expectancy and uh, when mr suzuki signed the joint venture with the government his critics in japan also took the view that uh, this looks like the beginning of the end of suzuki right now in that kind of a background and where people said that look the indian car market is 30 40000 cars a year why are you planning 100000 additional cars in india where will they go where will you sell them so don't do that stick to some small volume and see how you get on and then let's see what happens so that was the kind of atmosphere in which we started and we were all very different when i left the ias to join maruti i think all my colleagues thought that i was daft <laughs> this guy who's uh, most likely to become a cabinet secretary right is uh, just joining a company which has no future which is a sort of political company what right. what the hell is wrong with him right so looking at that background and uh, seeing how things have happened over these 40 years one starts wondering what did happen how did it all happen and why did it all happen in in a country where till very recently nobody gave any priority to manufacturing so sure. nobody thought manufacturing was something which indians would do well mm mm-hmm. but here we are we changed the face of manufacturing we changed the face of the automobile industry we changed how people viewed india as a manufacturing uh, country and all of that happened so that's really it makes sometimes you feel that what happened so it's overwhelming for you to sort of go back and view this journey sir but what about you personally you said right you already had a prolific career in the services by the time you came to maruti what was your personal motivation to actually make that switch at that point in time right were you resonating with that vision that we need a car for the common indian man yourself i was as ignorant about the car industry in 1981 as anyone could be right except for the fact that i knew how to drive a car and a little bit about the car nothing else and uh, i had no i mean i can't say i was a visionary or anything i had no idea that this industry would grow the way it grew it just happened so you, it was a leap of faith for you you weren't really uh, you didn't have a long term view I that it's going to be Maruti this success because uh, set of circumstances then was such that it was very difficult 
not to continue in Maruti because that would have been looked upon as a, you know, deserting right. the ship. And the ship being what it was in those days, you didn't think of deserting it. Absolutely. So that was one factor at that time which was important. I said, after all, if I work in government, it's the same government whom I'm deserting from their pet project. Correct. So that was one. Second also was a factor that uh, in those days, Alisha, there was no opportunities for a civil servant after retirement to do very much. And in those days, salaries and pensions and all were minimal. So there was also a question of uh, how would one make a future for one's family after retirement. Retirement age then was 58. Right. So it was a thought that maybe by joining a company you'll acquire some new skills which could help you to do something after retirement. So there was that kind of a motivation also. Nothing to do with the growth of the company. <laughs> right. So very humble sort of motivation if one was to call it that. Yeah, absolutely. Right. But then, so you mentioned that there was very little opportunity for anyone to really even pick up skills about how to manufacture a car in India, right? The cars that you saw at that time uh, were almost looked at as if they were saddling the owner with quality issues. Uh, whatever one was making, they were able to sell. That's also something you've written in your book. Um, so there must have been a paradigm shift involved, right, when you set up Maruti Suzuki because you had this foreign investor come in, probably with a very different, you know, ethos of working. What were your learnings there that you would say have stayed with you to this day and perhaps made Maruti what See, it is? The, the, you come to the crux of the matter. We, we meaning Mr. Krishnamurti and myself, we both had fairly good careers, in fact, in some ways, very good careers where we were. Mr. Krishnamurti was the doyen of the public sector. He was considered the best manager in this field. I was uh, the topper of my batch. I had been doing pretty well. I'd been having good job. So we didn't want to fail. We also realized that if we followed the conventional way of going ahead, the chances of success were very low. The discussions with the Japanese, and particularly with Suzuki, opened a new window. We realized that if the Japanese, with all the handicaps Japan has in terms of availability of any kind of mineral resources, energy resources, and all that, and distance to markets, could succeed, why not Maruti? But we would have to, then we asked Mr. Suzuki. He said that I'll help you do everything to get up to the right quality and production standard. But then you have to listen to me. Mm -hmm. We became very good students. We learned from the Japanese. But we also realized that you can't do a cut and paste job from Japan. Their culture, their discipline, their background, their homogeneity, very different from our highly diverse society with its uh, individualism more than collective working and, you know, so many differences between India and Japan. So our task became that you learn what has worked in Japan, what you need to do, but how do you adapt those practices and develop your own practices and systems to make those practices come true in India. I think that was our role. The Japanese role was to keep telling us that this, this, this is what needs to be done. Our role was to make it happen in the Indian conditions. So that's how this partnership worked. And uh, I think one of the factors of success was this whole concept of partnership. We understood from Japan that if Japan and we work together, with confidence and trust in each other, it would go a long way. But we also had to have a partnership with all our employees. Mm -hmm. Because if all the time, as happens in a lot of industries, workers and managements are at loggerheads 
and fighting with each other and looking at each other as adversaries, you don't get very far. The Japanese showed that if they work together, you make excellent progress. So uh, one of the tasks was how to create this kind of partnership in India. That became our task, that how do you mold everybody in the organization as a single team with a single objective of growing the company. We could do that. We realized then the partnership concept could be extended to the supply chain. The vendors should become our partners because if we both worked to help each other improve and grow, both will benefit because the quality cost of the car was dependent on the quality and cost of the components. Sure. So working together again would help in that area. That is again a Japanese learning, but translating into India was a different proposition. So that's how these things happen. So trust and uh, partnership. These two learnings we got straight away from the Japanese. Then Mr. Suzuki talked of other things. He saw example, punctuality. Productivity is very much dependent on how many hours people work. If you have a working time of say eight hours, do you work for eight hours or do you work for five hours? Sure. Makes a huge difference on the output. Right. If in a year you have 300 working days, do you come to work on 300 days or do you come to work on 270 days? Makes a big difference in productivity. So these things brought us new concepts of how to improve productivity. So we had to train our people that please attend office more regularly. Now the attendance in Maruti is 96-97%. People don't take leave. They take leave or go out when we have the closure for the maintenance. Otherwise they don't take leave. They understand that it is in the company's interest and their interest to work all the days. They come well before the shift starts, so that actually if the shift starts at six o'clock, they are on their uh, positions on the line, ready with all their tooling and whatever to start work at six. We don't lose time. So time, punctuality, all these concepts had to be brought into the company. So that became the third part, frugal management. Right that if you want the company to make profits and earn resources and have reserves and grow, not only must you make profits, but you mustn't fritter away the money in the company. Because uh, if you generate profits and then you give it to everybody as big dividends and big bonuses, the company has nothing left. People will spend the money and that's the end of the story, nothing happens. Indian industry has suffered from that problem. Sure. Very few companies have strong internal resources. They're all debt, heavily indebted. We keep reading every day about this company is over leveraged, this com company has gone under because it couldn't service this debt. Banks have 50,000 crores of NPAs with so on, you know, that kind of stuff. From the beginning, we were very frugal. And the result has been that we have grown from our initial 100,000 to over 1.5 million, all from internal resources. We are now going to do Karkoda, which is, let's say it goes up to a million units ultimately, all from internal resources. We have cash reserves of about 41,000 crores, all from internal resources. We are debt free. So that is the strength of frugal management then. Right. So a lot of frugality in terms of building your organization and then just like running a tight ship in general has... Everywhere save money. Right. Don't waste anything. Do you see that tendency, sir, uh, uh, change perhaps or, you know, not be looked at as seriously in automakers that come to India or have come to India after you? And uh, what would you say, you know, of course, nobody can take the fact that Maruti has a grip on the Indian consumer the way it does. Uh, but beyond that, what do you think uh, really set you apart from the competition that's come later with 
in, in a lot more favorable conditions, a lot more resources? I think part of the fact is that we came in before everybody else and we came in with the right product and with the right approach for the Indian market in terms of focusing our attention primarily on the customer. In India, again, before your time, but in the good old days of socialism and controls and licenses and all that, the consumer was nowhere in anybody's uh, thinking pattern because it's people sitting in Udyog Bhavan or uh, Yojana Bhavan who decided what should be made, how much should be made, what should be the specifications, and that's it. The manufacturer did not have the right even to change specifications. The customer was told, this is the product which you have, take it or leave it. Right. Now, for the first time, despite the shortages, we started looking at what will make the life of the customer a little bit better than what it used to be. Where will he feel that somebody is actually thinking about his requirements, thinking about his needs and trying to cater to those needs. The Indian customer is not used to that. They never expected it to happen. It never happened for 40, 50 years. But so let's say, did you sort of have to engineer the car backwards from a price point? Let's say that, you know, the customer, the kind of customer you were going for will also only have this much cash to buy a car. Sure. So India did you go backwards country. from there? We, right. In 1980, we were not at all well off. Sure. So we had to take that into account. So like we never opened sales anywhere without having adequate spare parts and a work properly equipped workshop along with the sales dealership. So that the customer, if he bought a car, received prompt attention. Right. We spread out the sales the service network through the uh, masses, what we call multi-authorized service station, so that customer service requirements were met. This is again something which was different from what happened earlier. We tried to hear what the customers were saying. We talked to the dealers, dealers talked to the customers to get back from the customers what their problems were, try to incorporate it. So this approach of being more customer centric was also something which helped people to develop confidence. Many of our practices made customers feel that uh, we are really caring. For example, you know, Initially, all the car, there was a huge shortage of cars, you know, when we started. About a five years period of more wait, that, I believe. More than that, half. Maruti 800 had a premium, which was almost 100% of the cost of the car. Right. People bought a car on the road for 52,000, sold it for a lakh of rupees. That kind of situation. But to avoid any feeling that the company was favoring some and was in some way manipulating the whole system. We brought in that system of prior booking and then a computerized draw system. People were initially thinking the draw would be rigged. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's the normal way sure. of thinking. Yeah. And then we proved to them and they saw the list coming out and they said all kinds of unknown persons were on the top of the list. And uh, many VIPs were way down the list. So they said, ye to lagta. But you would have met with resistance, right? I mean, considering that your origins also came sort of, you know, you were closely associated with the government, right? So didn't you meet with resistance that, you know, this is a company so close to the regime uh, and yet you go ahead and... But because we said, look, we are not going to get involved in any of this other kind of business. We want to give the customer as fair a deal as possible. If somebody is going to make money from the premium on the car, let it be the customer, not us. We are making our normal legitimate profit. We don't want these uh, right. off the book profits kind of thing. Sure. So the, the, this kind of approach is what strengthened us. Many of the people who came from outside 
brought in big cars thinking that the Indian customer will move, move up. Like the rest of the world is mostly big cars. They didn't understand the Indian customers or Indian market. And therefore, they never got to volumes. They didn't understand the importance of having adequate number of workshops. Today, many of the cars of the other manufacturers, they are good cars, there's nothing wrong with the cars. But to get it serviced or get spare parts, people have to travel long distances. Right. Why would they do that if they can get a car which is equally good and available uh, within a few hundred yards? Right. So that kind of thing has made a difference. So since you talk about small cars and of course that's been Maruti's main stead, it's where it dominates the market like no other player. Uh, but recently there has been so much conversation about how the Indian customer and this market is also sort of coming of age, right? that we want as evolved a car as any other market, as any other customer. Customers are so aware, they're talking about safety ratings. They're saying, why do we get a product that's sort of aged in another market? Why do we get a product, you know, a same product that's being exported elsewhere with better, uh, you know, better appointed product, but we don't get the same deal. So they feel short change now when they feel that the product lacks in comparison to what a global peer would sell in another market. And in general, there seems to be this move away from small cars. Your thoughts on whether you agree with that? You've spoken about how there's two different markets and everything, but taking the broader view of things, do you see we are coming of age in a sense? You know, India has uh, evolved into actually two markets. There's still the low-end market, if I may call it, or the Bharat market, if I may call it. Every year, more than 20 million scooters are bought, two-wheelers. Right. There's a population of 230 million, I think, registered two-wheelers in this country. Now, that market is still the lower end of the market. These guys who have two-wheelers and who buy two-wheelers, they don't have the means to buy a car. Even a low-cost car, they don't have the means to buy. Sure. That's their income economic situation. For those guys, what you're talking about, that they were feeling short change, doesn't hold true. Because they would be more than happy if they could buy a basic car. But there is the other market, which is uh, as sophisticated, as developed, as affluent as a market in Europe or anywhere else. And that is the customer who is wanting the best of everything. And uh, he's the pioneer. And most of us don't talk to the market, which is the Bharat market, because those customers not in our social circle. The customers we talk to are in the upper Urban, market. Yeah. And those are the people we talk to, so we get our feedback from them. So when we say that the customer wants this and wants the latest and wants X and Y and Z, it all relates to that market. Somebody needs to talk to the scooter market, the guys who are using scooters for many, many years, and ask them what do they want. Because uh, India's development cannot take place with upper-end market. This lower-end Bharat market has to move up. And if they remain confined to a scooter, how do they move up? From a scooter moving to a 15 lakh car is not going to happen. It's too big a jump. So between that also now there is inflation. Uh, there's general inflation of course, there's commodity price inflation. Regulations have made small cars expensive. Maruti vacated the diesel segment because of that reason, right? That it would have just not been viable to make a car uh, that could still appeal to that customer with the BS6 regulations. So that, that gap now has increased anyway. So from a manufacturer's point of view, um, would you rather not, let's say, add that, uh, you know, layer of sought after features or add that layer of, you know, safety that a customer in the you know, aspirational markets is going for anyway, and then let's say sell a fairly similar standard of product across 
the country. I think we need to cater to both the markets. We can't ignore either of the two markets because uh, we are a big national player. And I can't say that I'll concentrate only on the Bharat market or I'll concentrate only on the India market. Right. I have to make both. As far as regulations are concerned, those are fixed by government and whether it's for the India market or the Bharat market, I have to comply with them anyway. Do you think the way they're structured right now perhaps puts the Bharat market at a little bit of a disadvantage? I mean, for players like yourselves, you have we a big have seen, play in that market. We have seen in the last three years, the lower end of the market has been most hit because the percentage increase in prices of cars has been maximum at that level. Cars below 5 lakhs have almost halved in terms of the percentage share in the total market. That's the price. Not that customers are not there. Scooter, 230 million scooters are very much there. That's the source of the under 5 lakh car. But because of the price increase, that segment of the market has not been able to even buy a 5 lakh car. So that market is shrinking in terms of total volume. The upper market is growing, but not growing very much in total numbers. That's why if you look at the total car sales in India, we are still below what we were in 1819. So if we are saying that there's a move away and people are growing in the upper market, why isn't the car market growing? It's because this market is shrinking. And somebody needs to think that if this lower market keeps shrinking, can the upper market keep growing forever? Correct. So in that event, uh, a lot of, I mean, your contemporaries, uh, you know, in car manufacturing are already moving away from the small car segment, right? Sure, that um, small car market besides will remain, you, I maybe believe, Maruti will be the only one catering to them. But would Maruti continue to cater to that we market? We will continue to cater to them. And yes. then as big, uh, and would it continue Even to be as big of a focus? Smaller volume market will still cater to that market. So that, that, that's really the sense I want to get from you right now because you have a sort of, you know, you have a slew of products lined up in the upper end of the market too. So, so we just introduced uh, the Alto. So we've also got something for the lower end of the market. So what gives you the confidence that this is a market, I mean, uh, you know, that will continue to see a growth trajectory? Arish, I'm confident that this downturn in the small car market is a temporary phenomena. I believe long term this market cannot be kept down. It has to grow, otherwise India will not grow. And what will happen to make it grow? Per capita incomes have to go up. Maybe some way the prices have to come down. But there is no way that uh, this country can ignore this large sized market and not allow them the benefits of uh, growth of the country. Then sir, what will have to give to ensure that growth actually comes back to this market? I mean, looking at the state of affairs right now, um, how soon do you think this could happen? Wait and see. Time, it's, as I said, it's a temporary phenomenon. Things happen for a short while, then they improve after that. This will happen here also. So for Maruti, sir, what does this mean in terms of, you already said that it could be a smaller volume market for you. But is that the way you look at Maruti's future, let's say, in, you know, in no, the but, ongoing uh, decade? We, the Indian car market will grow. Maybe it would not grow the light. It's not been growing the way it has been growing in the past. We have, I think, pointed this out earlier also in the last now 12 years. The rate of growth of the car market has been steadily coming down in India. I think this is something which uh, at some point the policy makers will also understand that if this happens, the growth of the manufacturing sector in India is going to slow down. And that is not consistent with what we want to do in the next 25 years. And the car market is a major part of the economy. You cannot afford it slowing down. So, 
give us an inside view of maruti right now i mean uh, when you are also doubling down on your SUE portfolio let's say because that's where you recently lost market share uh, you're also gearing up you know i mean you already have a hybrid product out you're gearing up towards electrification so there are all these new directions that you're moving into but there's also the small car which remains a very big market for you how would uh, how would you know the company think about this in the years to come right so do you continue to put resourcing and let's say r&d behind developing a better small car or applying newer technologies like evs or hybrids to even small cars we have to do all of it can't uh, ignore any segment okay going forward then sir uh, do you think that your bet on small cars will be as strong as it has been in the past yes. or do you that yes. doesn't change okay no uh, you've grown into i mean and you have been uh, for the longest time the undisputed number one sort of player in the market now you're looking at your next chapter where the market's a lot more crowded right you were virtually without competition for many years and now there has been so much competition new alliances between car makers are also being seen do you think that there is or could there be a real disruption to your position in the market in the next few years uh do you see that that's possible and what could it be if at all you know if you are talking about uh, the market share of maruti and its position in india I don't think that uh, there's any chance of anybody overtaking us as the number one car maker in India for a long, long time to come. The nearest uh, number two today Huge is uh, way below. Right. And uh, yes, in the last uh, two, three years, we have lost some market share. But as I said, many of these things are temporary phenomena. We've we've lost market share earlier in the year, uh, periods also, and we've recovered. And I think we will recover all our market share pretty soon. I don't see that in terms of technology, in terms of uh, productivity or quality in any way, Maruti will. lag behind anybody in the country or in fact in the world not only will suzuki japan provide the suzuki japan is the leader in small cars so sure. and small cars is still going to remain i believe the major product in india today 70 75% cars are below 4 meters in length the bigger cars which is above 4 meters is a small part of the market we also have an alliance between suzuki and toyota so i think with this kind of a lineup of technology sources and alliances and support the next 25 years which which we are now particularly concerned will see that uh, maruti will come very strongly in this period and so do you see that hybrids would be a big bet for you uh, because you have the technical expertise now between two of your partners i believe do that uh, as mr gadkari said yesterday india has scope for all technologies and all technologies will be required if we are to rapidly lower the carbon footprint and reduce the import of oil we cannot rely on any one single technology to do that because it will not do the job as efficiently as using all multiple technologies available so i think it's hybrid it's cng it's ethanol it's methanol it's biogas all these have to be built into our system because a large growing market it's not a stagnant market and in a growing market as volumes are growing the scope for everything to happen and do we expect to see all these powertrain options you know come out from the maruti stable as well as yes we have all of them here right we are doing uh, cng we are now going to be doing hybrid we are blending ethanol cars are uh, uh, ethanol friendly and of course evs are on the anvil and will come and join our fleet so all right. of it is there right 
Now, sir, a bit of a segue, but just going back to how, uh, you know, it's very widely known and appreciated that Maruti, the way you understand the Indian customer is very, uh, has very few parallels in this market, right? That's enabled you to thrive the way you have. Um, so at a time when you see, you know, the competition talk about such, uh, you know, such a decided shift towards premiumization and, you know, focus on things like profitability because they just find it so unviable to make a small car that can continue to, uh, you know, make money for them also. What do you think continues to set you apart? Of course, I mean, does it also give you an advantage that uh, it will sort of almost become a one manufacturer play for you? In the smaller car segment, if competition goes away, of course, we'll have an easier run. It's not necessarily the best thing because I've always believed that uh, competition makes everybody work harder and work better. Right. So, while uh, the lack of competition, in a sense, many people say is better for business, actually it's not. So I, I am not particularly happy that uh, we are losing uh, competition in this segment. And I wish uh, that uh, this market revives adequately to create opportunities for somebody else also to come into this segment. Right. So what has enabled you over the years to actually, um, of course, you have a massive network of dealers, you have a network of workshops that customers are very happy with you. You know, they think that, I mean, they can buy a Maruti car and it's the safest bet that they could make. That perception has stayed, right? But alongside that, there was also this perception that, you know, th these are frugal cars, you know, that we are buying, right? And if you have to buy a technologically advanced product, then you would perhaps go to another manufacturer. Um, is that a perception that you've had to, I mean, fight off at different points I in time? I don't think it's valid anymore because Maruti is offering cars which are technologically as advanced, as connected as any car anywhere. And uh, this perception that uh, Maruti is only a basic car and doesn't give the aspect... The Nexa has changed a lot of that perception also. Right. So do you continue to now going forward double down on the Nexa channel too? And I ask this simply because while you will have a strong small car play, uh, you know, going forward, uh, we are seeing that there are customers who are straight away buying into, you know, what's being called B segment car. So that jump is very, very prominent now. Uh, does that become an important part of Maruti's future also going ahead? Just catering more to this more evolved premium buyer of cars too? I mean, look at features like the sunroof, right? I think it's the first time you launched one in a car recently. No, as I said earlier, while we'll also we'll be concentrating on the small car segment and not neglecting it in any way, we will do whatever is needed to compete effectively in the bigger car segment with all the technologies which are required. Right. So speaking about, um, you know, electrification for a bit, uh, there is a couple of years to go before, you know, your first car comes out. And again, uh, you know, it's said that, of course, still Maruti really jumps into this segment. There, is, there isn't really going to be much of a market for EVs too. How do you look at the electrification story pan out for India? What would it mean for manufacturing in India itself? There isn't very much happening at the moment. Uh, the you know players who have come with EV products have brought in cars as fully built units. You know, barring of course one domestic manufacturer who's actually doing it meaningfully here. Will all of that change in the next couple of years? You know, the technology for EVs is still evolving. And it's very hard to predict what will happen two or three years down the road because there could easily be breakthroughs in, ba in battery technology or in some form of uh, uh, chemistry which goes into the batteries and things like that. How that will affect manufacturing, nobody knows today. So in terms of manufacturing EVs, Companies today, I think, need to be quite flexible. If you commit yourself to a particular technology and it's not easy to adapt to a new technology, you could get into serious difficulties. 
So we also need to be careful that uh, what is going to be the appropriate or the, the right, the best technology in for EVs, let's say five years down the road. So you're keeping that. Uh, you have to be, I'm only saying that in this, when a new technology is developing and evolving, it's not yet a finished product, let me put it this way. The EV technology is not yet a finished product. We have also issues like hybrid, uh, hydrogen as a fuel. So it's, it's a difficult task for manufacturers to decide how to go about this and uh, what sort of uh, commitments to make to what kind of technologies and how much and how much flexibility you will have. You have to keep these factors in mind. And uh, how to get all these things done is the challenge which policy makers and manufacturers have to face together. Sir, so as somebody who has uh such a serious bet again on you know this Bharat market. You've also spoken about you know how some regulations might not really lend themselves to this segment of cars. What's your view on that? Uh, how do you reconcile the fact that there is a need to make roads safer with the fact that a price point also have to, has to be kept in mind to keep the market going? Alicia, there's always a trade-off in anything. Everything in life, there's a trade-off. And at each stage, you have to balance the pluses and the minuses and see that you come out on the positive side. I wish we could have the best of the products everywhere. But that wish will not come true if we don't have the means to do that. So you have to balance out your means with what you want, with what is available, and what is the best which you can do. So there is a whole lot of uh, things in life which you have to balance. I may want a lot of things. I can't get all of them. From your customers, sir, uh, what do you think they would uh, you know, actually need at this point? Uh, do they continue to need a car that's at an accessible price point? Perhaps they can do without... Customers the... at all times make their views known by how what they behave they in now? the marketplace. So you have to keep your ears close to the market and listen to what the customers are saying at all points of time. And what the customer says today may not be what he says a year later. So the, the need to keep track of the customer and what he's thinking and what he's wanting is most important. So I can't today say that I know what the customer will want three years from today. I have to listen to him and understand what he wants. Right. So just taking, a, you know, a sort of forward looking view of things now, you started off, you know, uh, as a, you know, with, with Suzuki as your partner, you have now Toyota in the mix too, you know, bringing in different expertise, technologies, skills to the table. What do you think the next chapter for Maruti, Suzuki and Toyota now in the country uh, looks like? No, Toyota's partnership is with Suzuki, not with Maruti. Sure. But they come in and help. What is the yeah. benefit of that technology is that we, of that partnership is that we get technology access. Like this hybrid. The hybrid technology is actually Toyota technology, but we will be using it in cars which we will be selling under the Maruti brand. So I think that system will continue. We also get uh, access to interchange of vehicles and also in the export markets. Because in some areas where Toyota wants to sell small vehicles, they will use vehicles sourced from Maruti. So this kind of arrangement is actually a win-win for everybody, including the customer. Right. So now that you have, uh, I mean, a massive plant coming up in Kharkhoda now that gives you a lot of capacity, does that enable you to um, 
fulfill your ambition for or do you have ambitions to really scale up exports now meaningfully is that part of the next chapter for maruti we have scaled up exports in the last two years yeah. doubled exports in the last two years and uh, as i just mentioned because of uh, toyota being in the equation now i think the volumes of exports will keep going up i think new markets are opening up and uh, with the new kinds of technologies which are coming up uh, maruti will have an option of for increasing technologies and um, additional factor to that which as recent come is the ftas which the commerce ministry is signing right. i think uh, in the past we've always looked upon ftas with some suspicion because we think that we can't compete i think we need to start looking at ftas as an opportunity to export to other countries why are we different about our capacity to compete i think enough has happened in this country to make us feel confident that we can compete so i am all in favor of signing ftas and opening market for india and in exporting cars and uh, i think there's no doubt that we are making world class cars because sending to every part of the world today thanks so much for sitting down with us today it's been lovely uh, just walking back these 40 years with you and uh, no doubt in anyone's mind like you said that you will continue to be the dominating force that you are in the indian car market and uh, we're here to witness that journey too sir thank, thank you so because much. i do believe that uh, we have a role to play in what india will do in the next 25 years absolutely and, uh, i think that uh, we are determined to do our best to play that role absolutely thank you so thank much thank you sir. thank you